views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. And hello and welcome to the Social Justice Forums. I am Darren Hyman. Of course, we thank you for joining us. If you're asking what the Social Justice Forums are all about, well, we aim to bring you a deeper understanding, a deeper understanding of the issues and inequities that many people face, particularly in communities of color. Also, we'll be presenting multiple points of view and then also hopefully promoting some civic engagement. We invite you to join us as the Social Justice Forums starts right now. As we're starting here on the Social Justice Forums, we're going to introduce you to a very special organization. It's an international not-for-profit organization that runs youth service after-school programs in United States high schools, and then it also builds schools in developing countries. Their mission, really simple. It's to break the cycle of poverty, illiteracy, and also low expectations through service and education. They're also serving communities where youth who face issues ranging from gang violence all the way to food insecurity and homelessness. I'm pleased to be joined on and sharing in their point of view on the matter with the Chief Program Officer of Build On Us, Ms. Kayla Hunter. And Kayla, good to have you. Thank you for having me, Darren. I'm really excited for this conversation. Thank you. And so uh, glad to actually have this conversation and be talking. Uh, when we talk about the issue of social justice, obviously for you, um, your organization is front and center in dealing with a multiplicity of the issues that actually are attached to social justice. But for somebody who doesn't know about Build On Us, what that's all about, um, just tell us a little bit. Absolutely, so for our US-based programs, uh, we are really focused on empowering young people uh, in our public schools to serve their communities locally and become agents of positive change in their communities and also to help them in developing an, uh, a global uh, citizenship identity. And so before uh, we had to make some shifts given the global pandemic, uh, we were able to send our students uh, to some of our programs in places like Haiti and Malawi and Senegal and Nicaragua um, after they had done a, a couple of uh, service hours or quite a few service hours with us so that they could help build schools and learn more about the issues in that community. Uh, so we do a combination of working with our teachers and our educators uh, to engage our students in conversation about the issues that are affecting their community and then also empowering our students to find opportunities to be a part of the positive change uh, and, and engage and participate in service in their schools and in their local communities. Yeah. And when you talk about engaging them in community service, obviously that's major um, to learn about service, particularly um, when we're a community that faces a lot of challenge. And so giving back and uh, talk to us about that, how you cultivate uh, that spirit of giving back and service um, and really helping students understand how to pay it forward. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, so it's an ongoing part of what we do, right? We never stop doing that. Uh, we're continually reminding our students about the importance of uh, solidarity, being in solidarity with each other as students as part of their school community and what impact they're able to make there. And also uh, being in solidarity with the, the rest of their community uh, and how we can support each other and uplift each other um, to build the type of community that we wanna see and, and have an impact on building that and creating the future that they want to have. So we're challenging students to think about both um, some of these complex issues uh, like food insecurity and how that shows up in different aspects of their lived experience in their communities, their community members, um, and having those, those conversations to break down these big ideas um, to find op smaller opportunities where we can impact small change. Um, for instance, a lot of our students on a weekly basis will go to a food kitchen or a soup kitchen, excuse me, and serve. Um, we've also help, uh, given out food to the homeless. Um, and so where can we identify ways in which we can um, participate in being a part of positive change when it comes to some of these big issues. We break that down and then we support our students in getting out there and serving. 
And so when you talk about issues, right, we know that the United States and, of course, across the world, um, there are a multiplicity of issues. You do a great job of really allowing students to understand what the issues are. Um, and when we talk about what the issues are, sometimes there is this being naive and ignorance, if you will, um, a little bit more about the issue education, because I know that's important that before they get out to serve, they got to know what the issues are. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's where we spend a lot of our time and a lot of it is done in collaboration with our teachers. So, uh, for example, around um, with our science teachers, often uh, one of our annual projects we refer back to is um, tackling the big topic of environmental justice and having our students guide that conversation. So making sure that our students lead the conversation and we're elevating their voices and they're driving what types of uh, service projects they want to do is really important and is deeply ingrained into how we work. Uh, and so we will go into classrooms and build on what they're already learning uh, in their science classes and, and challenge them to start thinking about where they can impact change. Uh, so often our students will go into um, community gardens and parks and, and do service related to that. Um, but the, the education part is so, so important because that's where our students learn the impact of what they're doing and are able to situate uh, when we're going out into our community to serve the how that is contributing to the larger picture um, and and we find that those conversations are also really important for them understanding how they can be agents of change because they're not just showing up and um, putting food on someone's table but they are participating in in um, in in their community uh, and and really uh, inputting themselves into um, you know, a larger system and, and having an influence on, on that, which is so, so powerful. Um, and so that education piece is where we spend quite a lot of our time with our students. Yeah, and you use the word students. For somebody who wants to know where you get your students from, how do you go about uh, getting your students? Yeah, so we are partnered uh, with schools, but we do also allow students or are open to students from outside of those schools uh, to participate in our, um, our programming and it's been a great opportunity actually going digital has made that even more has made our programming even more accessible to students outside of the schools that we work in um, so students can get involved by, by following us on uh, social media specifically Facebook and Instagram at build on or by emailing us at info at build on uh, dot org and we have after school opportunities and Saturday opportunities for students to come and learn and participate in service yeah, and I want to talk a little bit about the borough of the Bronx because I know you guys do some great work here uh, in the borough of the Bronx, particularly um, hooking senior uh, students up, I should say, with seniors. Um, and I know that some of the work that you guys do have that has a student senior connection. So introduce us to that student senior connection. Yes, that was absolutely one of the uh, first things that our students were interested in continuing to do once the uh, global pandemic required us to shift to digital. And so a lot of our students, again, we're, we're encouraging them to get out and do service on a weekly basis after school. Um, and so a couple of the things we've done specifically with students in the Bronx has been um, calling isolated seniors who may or may not have regular as regular interactions um, as we did when certainly not with our students, but maybe not with other people as well, uh, since things have significantly changed given the global pandemic. Our Bronx students also um, reached out to some younger students and, and uh, transitioning eighth grade students to ninth grade gave calls to those students to kind of talk to them about what high school is going to be like and prepare them and support them and, and all of the transitions in schools our students are facing right now with the switch to digital learning. Um, another thing that our Bronx students did was participate in our uh, Make Masks Save Lives campaign, um, which we were able to make over 75,000 masks um, and engage students in um, leading their community and talking about the value and the importance of wearing masks and also guide them through how to use the mask making kits that we sent out so they can uh, create masks for their families and, um, and get out there and, and be safe. Wow. 
And when we talk about students, obviously a lot of them have been affected throughout the course of this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, for you as an organization, trying to work with your students, getting them to, to, to virtually pivot uh, and to pivot virtually. We know that students are pretty much uh, technologically savvy, uh, but talk to us, how much of a challenge was it to actually pivot virtually for both your organization and then also for your students? It definitely has been a challenge. Um, we interestingly have learned that uh, some of our students are joining us now for the first time. Some of students in the schools that we work at have joined us for the first time since we've gone virtual. So there's a new accessibility to our programming that we're really excited about. But we also have found, um, you know, in partnership with our schools that attendance uh, given distance learning is is a challenge that we are still um, trying to, you know, prepare to, to uh, be able to account for better this fall. So we have new opportunities for students to engage with us digitally, but meeting our students where, where they are in, uh, continues to be a challenge. Um, we have found though that some of our students are continuing to serve and are, are displaying that on social media, even when they're not coming directly to our programming, which feels like a testament to how we've been able to, um, to uh, encourage them to find whatever opportunities they can and they have accessible to them to serve their community. So one student in the Bronx specifically that's coming to mind is a Johnny, um, a student who along with their um, mother packaged and delivered food, uh, socially distant, of course, to their neighbors. Um, and this is a student who has consistently participated in our programming in schools, and to some extent, while we've been digital as well, but is also getting out there outside of Build On and, and continuing to serve, which is really exciting. Yeah. So what do you have coming up in the future? Sure. So this fall, we are continuing to offer our programs digitally. Um, we are going to be launching a leaders in training program this fall, which we're really excited about. It's something that our Bronx students actually led the charge on in the past. And so we are formalizing it and making sure that we're offering it to all of our students across uh, the nation. So that is an opportunity for our students to learn how to um, essentially do what our school-based staff do. They're going to learn how to um, coordinate with the community, create opportunities for service, and then lead that service in their community for their peers. Uh, so that Leaders in Training program is launching, and then of course we're continuing to do education, and um, whether it's digital or it's socially distant, to engage in service projects that support um, different areas of need in the community. And one of the areas that we are going to continue to focus on, of course, um, is the COVID-19 um, relief. And do you feel as though the students have a more uh, connectivity, if you will, to the area of social justice, given the fact that they've taken a lot of time in these service projects, spent some time learning the issues, are they more conscious or the word that we use, are they more woke? I, I would say that. I do think that for sure. And we, um, you know, given all of the things that happened in our country in the last five months, there are so many topics that we can address with our students, but they have spoken up and shared with us what it is that they feel passionate about. And it's, it's, um, it's community based, right? And so it, it's different in each of the communities that we serve, um, but social justice has become something that they want to gain more knowledge about, more language to understand a lot of these big issues. Um, and so that is definitely going to be, continue to be a focal point of, of what we do and how we educate moving forward. And so as we continue to move forward in this segment about to bring it to a close, uh, I wanted to give you an opportunity to share uh, with some of our viewers about uh, how students can get connected. You did say you take students from the outside sometimes. So how can those outside students come on and be a part? Yes, social media and also email um, and our website. So for students in the Bronx, our website is buildon.org slash Bronx. Uh, and as I said, um, Instagram and Facebook are the best places to reach us at buildon as well. 
All right, I want to make sure that people get connected there. And uh, so much great work that you guys are doing, Kayla. Um, students are taking part, but talk to us about the testimonies because after they've taken part in your program, what are you hearing people say? And what are you hearing the feedback uh, that's coming from having service involvement, having community involvement and being connected in such an impactful way? Yeah, oh, that's such an awesome, uh, exciting question. We have students that are coming out of our high school-based programs and going into college and continuing to focus on civic engagement, getting involved in many ways. We also have students um, and alumni that we keep in touch with who are in the workforce now and are have become educators, um, have become community advocates, and are at the front lines in, in the healthcare field. Um, and so I shared the example of a Johnny, who's one of our alum as well, um, who's been working with uh, his mom to prepare meals for their neighborhood um, and their neighbors in their community, which is just great to see. Um, but we, we've had students in a number of ways come back uh, and tell us that they learned so much from Build On, that the Build On continues to be um, like a second family to them and and a community that they can reach back out to and ask for support and during these uncertain times it's more important than ever yeah well kayla thank you so much for being with us and sharing a little bit about build on guys are continuing to uh impact young people in such a special way and when it comes to social justice of course putting them in touch and you know educating them on the issues is so powerful and so prevalent uh, needed to be prevalent in this in this day and age. So thank you so much, Kayla, for uh, your great work. Absolutely, thank you for having me. All righty. Well, listen, I want you to stay with us because we do have more on the Social Justice Show coming up. Stay with us. We're coming right back, right after this. <music> Who's most at risk for coronavirus? People over 65, people with underlying medical conditions like heart disease, chronic lung disease, asthma, diabetes, people undergoing cancer treatment, and people with weakened immune systems. What should you do if you or a loved one is at higher risk? Avoid close contact with people. Avoid crowds. Stay home if you can. Wash your hands frequently. Learn more ways to protect yourself and others at coronavirus.gov. And welcome back. Breaking Ground is New York's premier and largest provider of permanent supportive housing. When you talk about nearly 4,000 units of housing in operation in New York City and beyond, along with another additional 1,000 units in development. Breaking Ground's programs actually serve more than 8,000 vulnerable New Yorkers every year and through street outreach, transitional housing, and permanent, supportive, and affordable housing. And Breaking Ground's approach enables homeless individuals to really overcome some of the complex challenges they face in life posed by mental illness, substance abuse, past trauma, as well as other barriers in their stability. Now, to talk about the point of view on this matter, I am joined by none other than Mr. Kevin Norman. He's the Vice President of Property Management at Breaking Ground. And uh, Kevin, good to have you. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be on. Thank you. Thank you. And so listen, when we talk about um, housing, you know, housing and the work that you do is a major, as we said in the lead, but it's really tied and rooted in social justice. So from your perspective, how does housing and social justice line up for you? Um, so for me personally, uh, obviously, uh, being a born and raised Bronx native, seeing a ton born in the 70s, the Burning Bronx and like growth and you know periods fits and straights of success in the Bronx um, in and around housing in general uh, housing is a right and so obviously you know through our mission we believe that having safe and stable and affordable home helps to restore dignity in people encourages them to work on all of those issues that you highlighted in the intro that might have contributed to homelessness in the first place um, and in this period. Um, of very pronounced um, action and activity around social justice. It's never been more 
visible and more important that we get it right for those folks. Um, there's obviously a, a wide range of folks that are disenfranchised in, you know, when you talk about social justice and the impacts um, to the folks that are disenfranchised. And one of those ways, one of those institutions is obviously a lack of affordable housing. Um, so we, we, we take great pride in what we do in not just um, our mission based on the lack of housing, so, uh, affordable housing in, in, in the city and area, um, but certainly because we know that it connects on that level as well and helps yeah. to equalize some things for folks that are really the most in need. And as I said in the lead, you guys do a great job, and when I say not just a great job, but you're leading this city when it comes to providing permanent uh, supportive housing. So for people who don't know how you make that transition for people in getting them into permanent supportive housing, uh, give us a little bit of a background as to your organization and actually how you help people land on their feet. Sure. So, I mean, the organization is founded in 1990. Uh, it's a nonprofit building, uh, you know, they started off acquiring buildings, the Times Square Hotel, Prince George Hotel, and helping to transition people that were street homeless into permanent housing. Um, and, and first and foremost is our outreach program, which is 24-7, 365 days a year. Those folks are on the street in some of the toughest terrain, toughest neighborhoods, um, you know, and toughest areas as far as socioeconomics go where we have people that are street homeless and impacted um, by society that land them in homelessness. Um, they coordinate and engage these folks like none other that I've ever seen or encountered. And really before um, this period, you know, a recent period of time in my life understood that that's what it takes. Um, so they work to get those folks into what would be the second leg of the race for us, which is our transitional housing, which are the safe havens that we manage. Um, and there are other folks in the industry to do the same. Um, there, what the goal is, is just to stabilize the situation for them around housing. It's not meant to be permanent. It's meant to be a safe place for them to remain um, and be connect, start to be connected to services that help to better uh, stabilize the, the, those individuals both mentally um, and in, in terms of environment while we then go to work trying to facilitate permanent housing for them which is the third area um, you know the property management piece is which is what I run the permanent buildings um, so there's this whole other mix that occurs when folks while they're transitioning and once they get into permanent housing we have teams at each building we partner with um, top flight social service organizations that are our partners um, that are on site with these folks to engage them, assist them with all kinds of day-to-day -day living aspects, uh, you, know, you know, job <laughs> research, um, and just the fundamentals, you know, financial management, um, you know, people that suffer with some of those substance abuse issues, um, misuse issues, and mental illness issues. We help to coordinate and facilitate resource to them timely is really key. And so that's why it's important that we, we have folks on site with us. And then um, outside of our partnerships with those organizations, we have staff that engage them um, in all kinds of what we call tenant services. They put on events for them. They get them to engage in all kinds of activities so that they no longer feel isolated, that they feel as if they are part of a community, um, and that they begin to kind of come out of that shell a bit uh, that that would have them become homeless right in the first place because that that there's some tough decisions that you don't always have control of that lead to homelessness um, and so we, we do a lot of work in all of those ways to unearth those things and then help people feel whole again uh, at every single checkpoint um, of the three which is the like I said the outreach the transitional piece and then the permanent housing piece Walk me, th walk me through a little bit of what's coming through your, of who's coming through your door, not what, who's coming through your door. Because w many times when we talk about homeless, there's this actual picture of the most destitute person, you know, uh, you know, no clothes, cardboard box. And there are those. But the reality is with the homeless crisis that's happening, particularly in New York City, we're seeing more and more people um, who dress like I'm dressing right now, who look like I look, sure. and, um, and you would never be able to tell that they're homeless 
simply because society is actually, you know, in, in the way in the times has actually changed what the actual homeless person actually looks like. Yeah, to some extent, um, that is very true. Um, so, so we actually, the, the gamut, right, is who we service. Um, and so to your point, there are people that are highly functioning homeless individuals that don't have a permanent home to be in because it's unaffordable. Uh, so one of the beautiful things about our organization is some of the ways in which we have advanced, uh, you know, the, the way that we develop buildings is to make sure that we also have this element of affordability engaged. Those may very well be people that are living from paycheck to paycheck and one emergency disrupts their ability to have a home. Um, and they get transitioned into either a shelter or some family member's apartment or something worse, um, you know, just to kind of highlight the levels that you, you talked about. Um, and so any and all of those folks are who we engage and see come through our doors. Uh, there are people that go through, you know, a simple application process because they are in need of something more affordable and on the verge. And as discussed uh, just a moment ago, there are people who are out on the street um, in some of the most destitute situations, um, who are not unable to articulate things, by the way, um, but just in a really bad space uh, around needing some other support, either, either you know, around mental health or some, some, something else um, that we work really hard to find out what that is and get them into our space in a way that we can help, not necessarily to save them, but to help them become whole again. And, and independent again. Well, give me a little bit about the homeless process. I mean, the homeless population in New York City. What are you seeing right now, especially after COVID-19? How are things changing for you? Or as the work really increasing more? We know that with the possibility of evictions now happening in August, that actually your, your doors might continue to see more and more people come through them right now as the eviction process and the moratorium on evictions uh, comes to an expiration date. Yeah, that's true. Um, and so what we're doing in and around that work is obviously um, being funded by a number of different, um, you know, agencies and organizations in the city. Um, and beyond that, um, we, we want to be, you know, in compliance with what we need to be in compliance with, but we won't disrupt our core mission. Um, we, we have folks that, we feel like are in trouble. The ones that are with us, we work tirelessly and find ways to help assist them through those partnerships that exist on site at our buildings and in our programs. As far as what's on the street now and this um, looming um, you know, worry that, that is on the minds and hearts of many New Yorkers in particular around evictions, um, we are constantly, you know, we have a couple of buildings in development pipeline, and it's not that they'll be ready to go in time to save those folks from becoming homelessness, um, but we are concentrating our efforts on making sure we continue to develop resource that is there for folks so that if they do fall into homelessness, um, we're going to continue to be there. I think out and abound, um, I think the system, um, you know, in some ways, because people want to be doing what the system says we should do. Uh, but I do think that there's, you know, this, this element of what's the right thing to do that is constantly being asked right now. And we'll see the needle kind of move back and forth, I think, on the eviction numbers um, versus, you know, people that actually become homeless. Um, I think that the courts are going to have a large role in that. And I don't know the same way that you, you know, you ask if we're ready for what may occur. I don't know that the courts are totally ready for um, all of the potential cases that occur. Um, and what I'm not looking for is a, a log jam or an excuse, but certainly for people to do what's right for folks and to find ways to keep people from becoming homeless is the goal. If we can do that, then that's, that's magical. And, and it's critical, you know, especially in a time like now, Post COVID, I think numbers, budgets is going to be something that people start to look at. And you don't want to add <laughs> to what are already going to be some, you know, seriously depleted budgets as a result of the response to, to the COVID emergency and crisis. Um, and by making people homeless, you absolutely do that because you compel them to now need and use other resources that government must provide for and does provide for. 
Um, so we, we believe that like not having people become homeless and finding ways for them to continue to be housed permanently like staves off, solves a lot of problems before they get to, to occur. So that, that's, that's our goal and our focus. Um, we, we, we have a, a policy of like trying not to evict people at all. Um, very few people leave our, our ranks that way. So, yeah. And, and you've helped a lot of people uh, really go from street to house, um, from street to home. Uh, talk about the, some of the success stories. In my last segment, I asked, you know, share a little bit about the success stories. What are some of the success stories that you can share with us about people who have actually made that transition from the street and now to a place of stability? Sure. Uh, so I could anecdotally tell you a few things. Um, at events, you see it the most. Uh, some of those events that I talked about that are coordinated, I was at a function, nonetheless, in the Bronx, that I'm building in the Bronx, the Brook, which is, this is 2020, 10 years old. It was built in 20, 2010, 10-year um, 10 anniversary, where many of the tenants there at that building got up and gave testimonials that said when they first arrived at our building 10 years ago, they were in really troubled places. That since then, um, whether they had bouts with the legal system or bouts with uh, substance use and misuse um, or other illness and ailment, um, they are now stabilized in a way. Um, so many of those folks are working full time, uh, you know, once again, independent, reclaiming their lives. And they tell you this, um, ma many people have written us things and said tremendous things in passing. Uh, and, you know, most recently, while, while I was out of the building, um, the, the tenants will tell, they engage and say, thank you. If not for this, I would really be unable to say where I'd be right now. Uh, I, I, there, there are a ton of success stories. And again, it's a mix, right? In some of these buildings, it's not just all people that were formerly homeless. We have some low income folks in there as well who help to model and lift and are working constantly and contribute to this community that we build that help people move forward with, with, with forward momentum constantly. So, so, so um, in, in terms of numbers, uh, I fall flat today and be able to give you numbers on people that have transitioned into us and out into home ownership. Um, but I, I can certainly tell you that there, there's no shortage of people that approach us every time that I'm out and that let us know that what we're doing is profoundly meaningful to them. And if it's meaningful to them, it's meaningful to the communities that they once were in because they get to be seen as a model of someone that can transition from that into this and, and certainly to the community that they are currently in with folks that are struggling to yet come to grips with whether they can do that and be that. Um, so so that, that's the way that we try to make the magic is by example as much as the programs that we put together. Give you a final question before we close out. I, when you talk about you know, making the magic happen, you guys have really made the magic happen in Times Square. Um, you know, and we know that that's the hustle, that's the bustle, that's almost like, you know, the mecca of downtown. We talk about Times Square, tourists, visitors, uh, the working population, the economic corridor, right there in Times Square, but also a huge homeless program, I mean, problem. Uh, but you've been able to actually um, do a lot of uh, salvaging in an area that has been really uh, hit pretty hard. Sure. I mean, it helps to have such a phenomenal building, um, <laughs> you know, and the surroundings, obviously. Um, if you've ever been to that building, in particular, the Old Times Square Hotel is a masterpiece of architecture um, inside and out. Uh, and in and around that area, I, I think that there's some tremendous partners. I think that back to our outreach, um, you know, and, and those groups who really work with different consortiums of folks to perform outreach and get people into a familiar place with us and the programs and the things that we offer and helping the partners to understand in and around the area that though there is a homeless population and, um, you, you know, area, I, I don't really want to call it a problem because um, it, it's, it's, it's a way of being you know, as a result of some circumstance. Um, and if we go back to that and then help people address what those circumstances are, then we 
we solve for y, right? If it's a mathematical <laughs> equation. Um, but those partners in and around that Times Square area understand who we are, what we do, and help us to, you know, one, be patient with the folks that we engage, um, and in many ways provide additional resource in, in just by supporting our mission and allowing us to do what we do and others in that in, in this industry to do what we do around engaging these folks. And people have come a long way with respect to understanding what it takes to really get behind the eyes of someone that is street homeless and help figure things out for them to make them whole again. Uh, so that, I think that in and of itself is like in the spirit of New York, people coming together, um, not always understanding everything about one thing, but understanding that this doesn't have to be like this for anybody in our society. And we're, we're happy and proud to have people partner with us to really do to help you know, facilitate the change that's needed in the space. Kevin Norman, thank you so much for joining us. Vice President of Property Management for Breaking Ground. Uh, thank you for uh, sharing with us here on the Social Justice Forum. Uh, a lot of great work in the area of homelessness. Our pleasure to have you. Oh, my absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you, Attorney. Keep, keep doing the great work that you are. Thank you. All righty. Well, listen, we want you to stay connected to us here on the Social Justice Forum. We're taking a quick break. We got more show coming up when we return. individuals and organizations are fighting for social justice more now than ever before. In communities of color, they're tackling injustice in the areas of healthcare, employment, housing, and mass incarceration. Much more too. Those injustices are also created to violate fundamental human rights and deny equal opportunities to those that are looking to have just their basic human needs met. Here to talk a little bit more about the injustice and the insight into what social justice is and how we can make things better. Of course, our friend, brother, managing attorney at Polanco Law. He's also a political commentator. You see him on our Bronx Dead platforms, but most of all, you have him here with me a lot, JC Polanco. And uh, JC, good to have you on the Social Justice Forum, brother. Hi, man. Good morning. I'm so happy to be here with you. Good morning. Listen, uh, let's get right at it. Let's talk about, uh, first of all, presidential uh, politics. Uh, we know that recently, uh, Vice, former Vice President George uh, Joe Biden has selected Kamala Harris to be uh, his running mate, uh, the first African-American woman uh, to be on a ticket in a major way. Uh, what do you think this means when we talk about social justice? First of all, let's talk about what this means for Joe Biden. Did it hurt him or did it help him? I, you know, we don't know yet. One thing we do know is that this is a historic pick. This is an exciting time for our country as we have the first African-American, uh, but let's be very clear. This is a daughter of Jamaican immigrants and Indian immigrants. So this is uh, the first Jamaican immigrant, South Asian immigrant, uh, African-American uh, black candidate for vice president of the United States. And I gotta tell you something. As someone who teaches uh, at the Bormahan Community College, there's a lot that goes into these classifications. I know I'm the first one to say, let's not hyphen, we're all Americans. But there is something historic when the child of immigrants to the United States, especially from the Caribbean and South Asia, uh, gets to be twice elected statewide in the largest state in the country, run for president uh, herself and lose, uh, but then get an opportunity to run uh, as the vice presidential candidate on a major party ticket. This is a very big deal uh, for the country. It's a very big uh, moment for history. Now, there is there's this politics. So there's a lot of politics involved. Uh, there's a lot of questions about um, uh, Senator Harris. A lot of the people that opposed Senator Harris's campaign for president are now talking about how excited they are. 
well, you know, in the campaign, we're going to have to hear both sides of her candidacy. We're going to have to not only talk about the incredible opportunity this is for both Black and South Asian uh, Americans across the country in getting their first candidate, but we also have to acknowledge that when she was Attorney General of California and when she was District Attorney of San Francisco, a lot of the attacks that she got when she was a presidential candidate are going to come up. We're going to have to talk about the fact that while she was uh, Attorney General and then a District Attorney of San Francisco, uh, she had to be sued by the Supreme Court to have exculpatory evidence disclosed against a defendant that was uh, held in prison. And that there were thousands of incarcerations because of low-level uh, drug use, that there were incarcerations because of truancy. These are things that she's going to have to address. She's also going to have to address, and again, I know your viewers are like, come on, Polanco, don't rain on our parade. I am not. This is politics. She's going to have to address the fact that, in fact, she did accuse the vice president of being racist, that he was friends with segregationists, and he opposed busing. And she was like, I, am, I was that little girl. Remember that part of the debates? She's going to have to come out and address that, too. Politics is dirty. This isn't beanbag. I'm sure you've heard this quote before. So, you know, it's great, great opportunity in history, great opportunity for the South Asian community, the Jamaican immigrants in the Bronx have to be excited to see one of their own go up to the ranks of being a candidate for vice president. She's also going to have to answer a lot of those questions. It's going to be an exciting campaign. Yeah, but give me this, JC. Do you think any of this is tied basically to social justice, given the fact that you had this social unrest going, you had the George Floyd, the Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, and then of course you have Vice President Joe Biden who was out on the campaign trail amidst all of this happening, COVID-19. And we know that all these things are actually happening. It seemed to be, if you will, a perfect storm for having to insert uh, a woman uh, and then at the same time, an African-American woman. And many people are saying that it's because of the social unrest that actually Kamala Harris, not, and not taking anything away that she wasn't qualified, because we do know that she's, she is very qualified and capable to be able to run. But uh, how much did the, the social unrest become a contributing factor in Biden's decision? I tell you, that's an interesting question. And it's going to be one of the ones that a lot of professors are going to lecture and debate on on TV. I, I, it's, it's interesting because of two things. First, she's eminently qualified for vice president, right? right. Um, and unfortunately, as someone who studies diversity and inclusion, I have to be honest, I'm concerned about when the vice president made such a push and when our community made such a push about having an African-American woman selected. By doing so, you force the vice president's hand into almost having to pick one, thereby creating an environment where many Americans who don't know any better or are looking for an excuse to disqualify her are going to say she was only picked because. And that's unfortunate. Uh, she was picked because she's incredibly qualified. She doesn't deliver any states to uh, the vice president. California was going to vote Democrat no matter what. Now as to your question as to social justice, considering her record as a district attorney and attorney general, it appears to me that many of the leaders at the forefront of the social justice movement today um, would not be in line with a lot of the things that um, uh, Senator Kamala Harris uh, has, ha has had her hand on, right? It's, it's very difficult for her to say, I have been the person that has been uh, the prosecutor of thousands and thousands and thousands of Black and Latino teenagers and young adults for low-level crimes involving drugs. It was me. It was I who put people in prison for truancy. Both for me, I'm that social justice warrior. So the argument that because they selected her somehow, it's a, it's a high five to that very staunch uh, social justice warrior at the front of, the, of those marches, I think is incorrect. What I do think is this. I think that her selection is symbolic. And it's symbolic for a lot of people in the African-American and Latino community to see one of their own uh, be selected to be the vice president for a candidate who is in his late 70s and who could most likely be a presidential, uh, uh, um, uh, someone who will be president within a matter of a few years and who's positioning herself to be the heir apparent to the presidency after uh, Joe Biden, which can be a one-term presidency for all we know. So to answer your question, yes and no, her record is not one where the social justice warriors will be excited about. I see it in social media already. It is exciting because it's symbolic. 
Right. But now let's talk about the vote, because when you talk about African-Americans and the role that they play in the voting process, um, some people will say Joe Biden had to pick someone of African-American descent, somebody in a community of color, if he was going to be able to deliver home these votes. Isn't this a true statement? I think there's a lot of truth to that statement. But what I've heard from a lot of African-American leaders was that he didn't have to pick someone that was going to be his running mate because they were black. They would have liked it. Uh, but, you know, Vice President Biden has been clear that if he wins the election, we're going to have our first African-American selected to the Supreme Court of the United States, which is a very, very important decision and something that is important for history. So you didn't have to do this. Again, we go back to the have to. There is no more important vote in the Democratic Party than the vote of the African-American and black woman, period. It's a vote that's been loyal. It's a vote that the Democrats can count on. And finally, Black women have had their voices heard in this election of Kamala Harris. So this was important. But I've spoken to many leaders who say it's not the most important thing. The most important thing is what are you going to do about social justice? What are you going to do about some of the things that you pushed for in the past that impacted our community? What are you going to do for the future? Or how are you going to increase Black home ownership and Latino home ownership? What are you going to do about helping a black and Latino small businesses? That's what they wanted to hear. So, you know, in the campaign, he was going to have the opportunity to go out there and talk about his plans, not necessarily say, now I don't have to deal with those issues. Because look, Kamala Harris, that's not how it works. A lot of black and Latino Democrats that I speak to, remember, I'm on the other side. So I get an opportunity to be a fly on the wall for many of these conversations. They want to hear um, more about what you're going to do for our community. How are you going to end police brutality and keep our community safe? That's what they want to hear about. So this election was important. She's qualified to be president, which was the most important issue. Um, and again, as long as the ticket talks about issues that impact the community, they'll be in good shape. You know, we're going to keep this. Vi we're going to keep this video because I think this is probably the most that we've agreed in the whole, you know, in our whole time together. Um, and this, this is great. I mean, it's really great. But listen, let me ask you this. I, I wholeheartedly, I wholeheartedly agree with that. And I also think, though, moving forward, that as you talk about that, we're talking about someone that is going to be considered, quote unquote, the vice president not quote unquote, going to be considered and be nominated or elected to be the vice president of the United States. That's important, but you're absolutely right. The other positions that are around the president, the cabinet, the Supreme Court, these are things that I think many people will be looking to see whether or not the next president will have that kind of diversity in the White House, something that we really don't see. And then also to deal with the issues of mass incarceration, to deal with the issues of the criminal justice system. Do we see possibly uh, a Joe Biden, uh, a Kamala Harris, who has a background in these areas, become very much more vocal about these issues? Or will these be politicized? And do you see these things playing as a major important role in the, uh, upcoming, in the upcoming term? I do. I do. I think that uh, diversity is going to be very important for this if he does win. Remember, there's a campaign. And one thing we know is that the, the country will surprise us. It surprises us in 2016. The polls don't show that there will be any surprises coming in now, but there's a lot of power and incumbency. So while they're planning their campaign and how they're going to make sure that the Black and Latino community come and support them, uh, they also have to make sure that they win over those Obama-Trump voters. And while they're focusing on how they're going to fix the system and end this issue of uh, some of the issues uh, that affect social justice warriors in our community uh, at large, while we're talking about those issues, we also have to remember that you got to win 270 electoral votes. So you got to create a diverse uh, campaign team, which he does. You have to promise a diverse cabinet, which he has. He's, he's shown it with the selection of Kamala Harris. So yes, he's going to have to deal with some of the issues that affect us in, in cities and Black and Latinos, especially those of us. Uh, that have been impacted by some of the decisions coming out of Washington. But it's very important there that if the Democrats want to win this election, that they don't lose focus, that this election is decided uh, by a handful of counties in a handful of states by mostly independent voters. Um, you know, Democrats are going to vote for Democrats. Republicans are going to vote for Republicans. You're going to have maybe 15 percent of the Republican Party that may vote the other way or write someone in. Um, but the, it's the battleground state in the battleground counties. You're looking at literally almost a billion dollars on each side will be spent to win over a handful of voters that are going to determine this election. How do you talk to those voters? And that's why it's going to be important. 
for Joe Biden and uh, Kamala Harris to connect with those voters. So yes, focus on the issues that impact us here in parts of the Bronx. Yes, talk about some of the issues that affect the issues of policing, but don't lose focus of the fact that when you talk about defunding the police and dismantling the police, you will be alienating the independent voter in Western Pennsylvania that delivered the majority of the House of Representatives to Pelosi and the Democrats. You will be alienating the voters in Ohio. You'll be alienating voters in Florida that you need and in Michigan that you desperately need in order to win 270 electoral votes. In the Bronx often, and in Manhattan, in parts of Manhattan where I speak to a lot of people all the time, they're so focused on this one issue or two issues that really excite them and they think that somehow that's gonna translate to winning an election. You may win the popular vote. You could win the popular vote by 10 million votes if you want. It doesn't mean that you're gonna get to 270 electoral votes to win the presidency. So be very mindful. Exciting all the voters in Chicago, New York City, Houston, Miami, Los Angeles, et cetera. You may excite the cities a great deal and congratulations. That's not gonna win you one more electoral vote. So always remember that while you're dealing with the issues that impact our communities, always remember that defunding police and dismantling police um, and for example, like one of the things that I'm gonna share with your viewers that I know that many of you would like and, and agree with, but offering taxpayer health benefits to people that are here undocumented is gonna cost you votes in those counties because many people in those counties don't have enough money to have health insurance for themselves. So when you have a person like Kamala Harris who on the debate stage said, she's in favor of giving Medicaid and tax funded health insurance to people that are here uh, that are undocumented. It may sound very good to us in New York City because we, we work and I teach and I live with, with many people that are undocumented, we love them dearly. But when you talk about those issues and disregard the fact that you have independent voters in Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, Florida, who don't have health insurance because they can't afford it, that you're gonna take more money from them to pay for people that, according to them, shouldn't be here in the first place, you, end, you may very well end up giving um, Trump another four years. So be mindful. Yes, yes, on a lot of the issues that we care about, Darren, but, but don't push away those independent voters Obama, Trump voters that you need to win back uh, in November. So when we talked about President Obama and him winning the presidential election, we watched on that election map, a lot of those states that were traditionally red actually be able to turn blue yeah, this wow. time around. Let's ask the question, do, you have, do we have enough or uh, does, do, is there enough out there for people to be anti-Trump and in this presidential election, from a Republican perspective, I'm talking about strictly Republicans now, is there enough on the Republican side to be anti-Trump and vote anti-Republican come this presidential election? There's only a small number uh, of Republicans out there that don't support the president. I see it regularly in the polls. Uh, those, those voters will either vote for Biden or write somebody in or just stay home. Uh, but you know, in line with your question, if I may, Darren, take some artistic licensing with it. I think you're tailoring your question to the, uh, the, the moderate independent voter that could swing Republican or Democrat at any election. Um, these guys voted for, some of these guys voted for Trump in 2016 because they thought that Hillary was just corrupt and they're just gonna take their chances with, with Trump because of whatever. He's a businessman, he'll shake things up. Those are the people that are now voting against Trump and the polls are showing that they will be voting for Biden because they view Biden not as a radical, the squad member, they don't view him as one of these defund the NYPD, defund police people. He's actually said it. I am not that defund Democrat. Uh, he, he, re, he reminds a lot of those independent, moderate, Republican-leaning voters um, that there was a time where you had Bill Clinton-like Democrats that were part of what they used to call the DLC, these moderate Democrats that were pro-workers, pro-union, but at the same time were conservative or moderate on criminal justice issues. Uh, they may find a home with Joe Biden and there may be enough in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania to get him the, the election. Remember, this election was truly decided by what amounts to a, a, um, a sold out crowd at Yankee Stadium. If you could just go in the middle of Yankee Stadium and look around, that's how many people decided this election last time around. That's how many people are gonna decide, decide this election this time around. It's how you connect with those voters. And I think that the more um, you have vocal Democrats out there focusing on fringe issues like socialism, like universal socialism on almost everything that you've heard about here in New York that is very popular in New York City. So when you talk about socialized medicine, <coughs> when you talk about um, uh, um, uh, socialized income where everybody gets a minimum yearly income, 
When you talk about um, socialized uh, housing, where everyone gets housing and everyone should pay uh, a minimum amount, that kind of talk may sound very good to us. Uh, when you talk about canceling rent, sounds great to a lot of us, but when you get out of New York, the New York City bubble that we live in, that doesn't sound too good, and it's gonna cost the election in some of these parts of the country that I'm concerned about. Um, so if you're a Democrat and you're a socialist out there and you wanna talk about canceling rent and canceling this and giving everybody this and that, as if this was an Oprah Winfrey show, you may end up costing uh, your guy the election in November. Yeah, 56% of eligible American voters did not go to the polls uh, in the last presidential election. Uh, are we foreseeing this possibly being the case again? No, not at all. I, the kind of turnout that we're seeing, Darren, is incredible. There's a lot of energy on both sides of the aisle. We saw it in the Bronx uh, in the last congressional primaries. We're going to see turnout like we've never seen before. When I was commissioner of the Board of Elections in 2008, we had 2.6 million people show up to vote on election day. They came out to vote for President Obama. And I remember seeing the lines uh, uh, before coming into the poll site extend down, down many, many blocks. You're gonna see this, the same, the same turnout, if not more this time around, with the exception that there's gonna be a lot more mail. Uh, and because it's gonna be a lot more mail, uh, a lot of um, questions haven't been answered. The, the federal courts have gotten involved in, in answering some of those, but the legislature has to move quickly. For example, I know we don't have too much time on this, but I wanna make sure I'm clear. You know, voters um, are gonna vote a lot by mail this time around. That's gonna create a problem for the local boards of elections. And then they now have to count a lot of paper ballots uh, that are coming in. The question was, what happens when you get a paper ballot that's after the election date or postmarked after? What happens if the board of if the mail, um, if the post office receives the, the letter by election day, but doesn't postmark until after. What happens if there's no stamp on it and there's returns? I mean, all these questions are coming up and the federal courts are now saying, you're gonna have to just count those votes. That's gonna cause a problem in the courts, which means that we're not gonna get a, a, a number by the end of election night, which is going to contribute to uncertainty, which is gonna contribute to the narrative of the president that this election is gonna be a joke, that it's gonna be stolen, that um, mail is gonna be used to commit fraud. He's already started it, and there are a lot of people that are believing it. And then when you see it nationwide, where local boards of elections are not prepared for the onslaught of the kind of mail that's coming in, and where legislatures haven't been clear as to how to count those that come in afterwards that may be postmarked or were entered into but not postmarked until after election day, you're going to have a little, um, you know, well, you're going to have a major problem on election day. It'll be chaotic, and you may hear a lot of talk about there, there being fraud this election cycle. So be prepared for the president using that a lot on Twitter. Yeah. Well, I, that's, we got to leave it there, JC. But I want to thank you for taking the time and sharing with us uh, very much. We, we agreed a lot today. I think this will go down in uh, video history. <laughs> Maybe. Let's save this. <laughs> we're going to do that. Listen, and when we come back, uh, listen, I want to bring you back. Uh, we're going to have a topic where I know that we're not going to, we're, 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 we're going to clash heads, but I want to have this talk about another social justice issue, and that's the issue of gentrification that we're seeing in a lot of our communities. I know you've got a particular perspective on it, but certainly I want to be able to have the back and forth with you uh, in another show. Thank you so much, Darren. I appreciate you coming on. All right, JC Blanco. And it was not you want to know that JC is my friend and my brother. I have no problem in saying that. Friend and brother, JC Blanco. Listen, that about wraps it up for us here on The Social Justice Show. I want to thank you for joining us. Now, listen, you can check out The Social Justice Show every week here on Bronx Nets Channel 67, and then also uh, Channel 2133 if you have Verizon Files. I want you to also remember, please stay connected to us on bronxnet.org. Also, stay connected to us as we continue to bring you more information about people, issues, and things that are mattering to you and also making a difference. I'm Darren Jaime saying take care, God bless, and we'll see you real soon.